welcome all of our congregations. I want to welcome you to the fifth week of our series entitled Parables, Life Lessons from Jesus. Come on, can we just welcome everybody, those that are joining us online as well, the prisons and jails. And I do want to say I'm going to be finishing up our series next week, Palm Sunday, and then, uh, by the way, it's not too uh, early uh, to invite somebody to Easter service. I think we've got close to 30 services at all of our campuses, and, and uh, it's going to be a great time uh, to gather family and friends, all right? If you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to open up to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Today, I want to talk to you about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, let me say this. Last week, I talked about talking about the parable of the fig tree. We are going to do that one, but I'm running out of time because I've only got one more. How many of y'all would like next year to do parables part two? And, and let me tell you why, because I've got like 23 other ones to go. And so I realize I'm like, I've got them all. And I've got, you know, I've, I've got a whole bunch of them lined up. And uh, so anyway, I, I'm going to I'm going to do that next year. By the way, thank you for sending me some funny things. Uh, you can always send me funny things. I may use your joke. I may not. I may give you credit. I may not. Uh, you can send it to info at church of the king dot com. Here it is. A guy was praying. Dear Lord. So far, I've done all right. I mean, I haven't lost my temper and gossip. It's pretty good. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, judgmental, or selfish. Pretty good. I'm really proud of myself, God. However, in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed and begin the day. I'm going to need a lot of help. Come on, y'all. With... <laughs> this was an honest Christian. Okay, somebody that was really honest. All right. Today, I want to talk to you about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, I want to say a couple of things up front. I have taught on this parable before, but quite honestly, I've only taught the back end of it. I've never taught the front. I saw this week, actually on Monday, studying it afresh, that you really can't understand what would be commonly known as the Good Samaritan, the story of that, with really un without understanding the first part. So we're going to look at both parts. Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, there are two primary questions that are asked in this parable by a lawyer who is talking to Jesus. Very, very important. Let's look at the first one. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, to give you context and perspective. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. How I many you know it's probably not smart to test Jesus? And here's what he said. Teacher, he asked, what must I do? do to inherit eternal life. In other words, what is it that I'm supposed to do to inherit eternal life? In that statement, there is such a depth of understanding the psyche and the framework that this man is operating from. What must I do? In other words, what are the things that I need to do that I need to achieve to have eternal life? I think it's a question that people even ask today. How good do I have to be? I, I, I asked, I had a conversation with a guy one time, and he said to me, he goes, I said, well, you, are you a Christian? He goes, well, he goes, I like to think I am. I, you know, I said, well, you, do you, I mean, do you know God? Well, I, I think so. Where well, are you going to go to heaven? Well, I, I, I hope. And I said, what do you mean you hope? He goes, well, when I get up to heaven, I mean, I'm going to, I said, well, well, tell me, kind of envision the conversation between you and God. He goes, well, I guess I get up there and God kind of weighs out my, my good things I've done, right? I've, I mean, I've helped some poor people. I've, I've been, but, but then I guess he kind of weighs out my good and my bad. And, 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 I, and I'm sure if I'd done more good than bad, I, that makes me a, a, a good person. If that is your basis of how you, A, have a relationship with God, and B, whether you go to heaven forever based upon God's grading scale, you better hope he grades on a curve. <laughs> and you better hope you were real good that day when you died. Nobody has a relationship with God. Nobody begins a relationship with God. Nobody sustains a relationship with God based upon you doing better than somebody else. What must I do to have eternal life? Now, this man was a scholar what does that mean? He was a lawyer and a scholar. 
an expert in the law. Well, we know that the law for a Jewish person, the, five, the first five books of the Bible, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, the, the first five books of the Bible. He was an expert in that. Matter of fact, Jewish people call that, uh, they, they, would, they would call that the Torah, the law of God. He, he was an expert on how Jews were to, to live this life down here, every aspect of it. And now he comes into a conversation with Jesus, by the way, who was a Jewish rabbi, a teacher. And he begins to have a dialogue with him. This man's understanding was that he was a good performer. And therefore, based upon that, he should get good credit with God. Question. How does someone get saved? How does someone, quote, get right with God? In the Old Testament. How about the New Testament? It's only been one way. There's always only been one way. It has not Related to what you do. It's related to whom you believe. Matter of fact, this man, he knew Genesis. He knew this scripture. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Abraham believed the Lord. How did somebody get right with God in the Old Testament? It's the same way they got right in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, they looked to the cross. In the New Testament, we look back to the cross. The Bible says Abram believed the Lord and it credited him for righteousness. In other words, it wasn't his works. How many times people get hung up on that, right? We compare ourselves one to another. The problem with comparison is, well, I did a little bit better than this person. The problem is if you, if you compare your walk with God based on how well you're doing versus somebody else, you'll either be prideful based upon I'm doing better or you'll be ashamed I'm not doing as good. But that's not the evaluative tool. That's not how God sees it. Paul was so clear. I love this verse. It's just like a, it's just like a plumb line. It's just like, choom, here it is. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for it is by grace that you've been saved. It's not your works. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith. Abraham looked to the cross by faith. Paul's talking about looking back to the cross by faith. It's what Christ did, his work. It's through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. How, how, how can you boast about a gift? You don't earn it. You don't achieve it. You receive it. It's a gift of God. Everybody say, a gift. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. This man has a problem. And by the way, Jesus perceives he has a problem. He sees it. The problem is this man was prideful because he realized in his mind he was thinking, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. So Jesus goes on. Luke chapter 10, verse 28. We're going to get to the Good Samaritan, but you'll see it, I promise you, different than you've ever seen it at the end of the message. Luke chapter 10, verse 26. <clears throat> well, what is written in the law? He replied, well, how do you read it? He answered. So Jesus said, well, how do you read it? He says, well... Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what I ought to do. By the way, that's Deuteronomy 6, 8. That guy knew that. He said, well, Jesus, I'll tell you what. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy strength and with all thy mind. Then he goes into Leviticus. He goes, and love your neighbors yourself. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Jesus replied, okay. You got it. Love God with all of your mind, with all of your strength, and love your neighbor. And here's what Jesus says. If you do this, you'll truly live. Now, right then, that guy should have said, I fall short sometimes. Don't you? I know I do. I I'm asking everybody, all of our locations, don't you fall short sometimes? I know I do. But he didn't do that. He, he, he. This guy was a tough cookie. He, he said, well, <sighs> instead of just confessing his need for God right there, I fall short. I don't always love God the way I should. Why is it so hard for us to admit our need for God? I wonder. Yeah, you guys have heard, you know, bottom of the barrel. You know, somebody, somebody's just got to, they've just got to, you know, Go all the way down. Do you really have to be broken by life circumstances before you look up and say, I need God? 
Now, I don't think you have to. Unfortunately, we often do. Why is that? Because we, we want to make it happen. We don't want to, who wants to admit their need, right? That's for weak people. Maybe so. This guy was unwilling to admit his need. Matter of fact, he actually goes to another level. He not only didn't admit his need, he actually goes to a whole nother. He, he's, he's, he's testing Jesus. Watch this. Verse 29. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked. He wanted to, you, know what, did you, you know what it means to justify? Well, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm a pretty good guy. Let me, let, me, let me quiz you guys, all right? This is the contemporary American mindset related to sin. If you somebody said, well, have you ever, you ever sinned before? I mean, I had a conversation with people, you know, before. It's like, you, do you know God? Well, you know, kind of. I'm not sure. Are you going to go to heaven? I hope so. How do you get to heaven? Well, I kind of weigh out the good and the bad. And then I'll say, okay, okay, time out, time out, time out. Okay, there's this thing called sin. It separates us. Okay, have you ever sinned before? Well, I mean. I mean, I kind of, I mean, yeah, really. But I mean, I'm not. I mean, I like, I've never, I've never. Did y'all see my notes? How did y'all know that? How did y'all know? How did, you, how did you know that lest you've said that? Or you've heard that? What I'm saying is we justify ourselves. Did y'all see that? I'm pretty good. I never kill anybody. Well, you're just an angel. Are y'all with me? Everybody say, that's good preaching, Pastor. Come on, just say it. Just Okay. You're in my notes. That's this guy. Trying to justify himself. Watch this. He goes, all right. Well, who's my neighbor? In other words, Jesus, identify the target. Oh, how much he missed the target. He thinks Jesus is about to... Don't miss this point. He thinks Jesus is about to give him a target of who his neighbor is, but he's actually going to give him a target of who he really is. So hence the story, the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, verse 30. That's going to become very important at the end. Luke chapter 10, verse 30. All right. In the reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, when he was attacked by robbers, and they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Left him as just dead on the road. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and, and well, when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. He didn't want to get close to that guy. So too, a Levite, it's a religious leader, same thing. When he came to the place where he saw the man, he passed by on the other eye. But a Samaritan, we're going to talk about what a Samaritan is. About. As he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, the Bible says he took pity on him. He was moved. His heart was moved. He took pity on him. And, and what did he do? He had action. He he went and he, well, he bandaged the guy's wounds and he, he poured on oil and wine. And, and then he put the man on his own donkey and he brought him to an inn. He brought him to a hotel and, and, and he took care of it. He actually took out his own money and he began to pay for the man. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. Look after him. And when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. I want to talk to you about three principles of an authentic relationship with Jesus. How you begin that relationship, how you sustain that. Number one, we don't ignore the needs of others. Luke chapter 10, a priest happened to be going down the road, and when he saw the man, he passed by the other side. So to a Levite, when he came, he saw the man and went, here it is, here it is. They're coming down the road. By the way, interesting. Those of you that have been to Israel, I've been there a bunch of, bunch of times. And, and Jerusalem is like 2,400 feet above sea level. This is interesting. A little Bible trivia. Jericho, where he was going, 13 miles east of Jerusalem. Jericho is actually 900 feet below sea level. 
You think New Orleans is below sea level. This is another level. I think it was like 13 feet, uh, 900. It's, it's like, it's, by the way, Jericho's right by the Dead Sea. Did you know this? The Dead Sea is the lowest part on the earth. Isn't that amazing? All right. So 24, 2,500 down to the, so he's coming down about 3,500 feet. And if you ever go there, you'll see this. You'll see that the roads, I mean, have been modernized some, but it's still the cliffs on the side and it's rocky. The perfect place to be robbed, by the way. Why is that? Well, they've got boulders and they've got, so these robbers, you know, they're hanging out. By the way, that was a, that was a, a, a used roadway, big time. The merchants would go and back and forth and they go to these different places and Jerusalem to Jericho, big time. And so you got these robbers, they're hanging out behind these rocks and all of a sudden, here comes this guy, he's coming down. The robbers come out, all right? They, they, they rob the guy, they strip the guy, they beat the guy, and they leave him for dead. Wow. And the Bible says there's two religious guys. Jewish context. Jewish guys see a Jewish man left for dead. How do they respond? Well, the priest goes, oh, ah. The Levite religious leader, both of them, they're like, Ah, now I don't know why they did that. Maybe number one, maybe they were just, maybe they went around the guy. Maybe it's because they were just too busy. How often in our lives we'll see a need and, but it's just, we're just busy. You're busy. I'm busy. We're all busy, right? We got things to do. We got, I mean, come on. I mean, we know, we know that somebody is left for dead right there. We know they've been stripped. We know they've been robbed. We, we, we can see them. They, they may be moaning just a little bit, but, but we're busy because we've got things to do. Maybe they were busy. Maybe they were scared. Maybe they thought, if we stop... These guys may jump out behind the rocks. Maybe they're still here hanging out. Ah, a trap. And if we stop, we may get robbed and we may get beat. I, I, let's just keep going. Maybe it's not they're too busy. Maybe it's not that they're scared. Maybe it's that they didn't want to get unclean. You know, there's, there's, there's ceremonial laws and things in the Old Testament. These guys were like at the top of the food chain, man. Pure. But what they fail to realize is that the purity laws in the Old Testament were not to keep you from helping people. It was to keep you from sin. How many times in our lives we, we're, we're, we're scared as if Christ is not strong enough. If we get involved with this person's life and help them out, they may make us, well, they may make us dirty too. Wow. I don't know exactly why they didn't stop. The bottom line is they didn't stop. They went around the need. Number two, the second thing about an authentic relationship with Christ, with God, was we, we, we live with a heart of compassion for others. Luke chapter 10, verse 33, but a Samaritan, not a Jewish man, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. What does that mean? His heart was, was moved with compassion. Let me give you some context of who Samaritans were. Samaritans... For those of you that know a little bit about maybe Bible backgrounds, and stuff, who were the Samaritans? There is actually, if you go to Israel today, there is still a place called Samaria, above Jerusalem, below the Sea of Galilee. It's kind of the, maybe the middle section of Israel. Where do they come from, Samaritans? In 722 B.C., you had the Assyrians, like Syria at an A.S., Assyrians. They came and took over the northern tribe. Watch this. Now the Assyrians and the Jewish people, they, they, they intermarried and they, become, they became Samaritans. Here's the problem. The Samaritans were deeply hated by the Jewish people. To the point that when Jewish people had to go, go, get, go to northern Israel, they would actually avoid all of Samaria. Do you, I went to... Israel, last time I went, 2015, do you know that there was, in 2015, 700 living pure Samaritans still today? The, no, the number one anchor, the number one anchor in all of Israel is a woman 
And she's a Samaritan. She's actually a Samaritan. Well, in Bible times, you, let me just tell you, Samaritans and Jews, they didn't, the Samaritans hated the Jews. The Jews hated the Samaritans. The irony of this, that you've got a Samaritan man that stops and sees a need. Wow. Question. When we see a person in need, what goes through our head? Maybe the better question is, what goes through our heart? I think oftentimes, because we're allowing something to go through our head, we can rationalize it away, and we can deny really what's moving our heart. This Samaritan was, was he, saw, he, he, he showed, there was, a, there was something on the inside where, where he was moved. By the way, showing pity is the same thing as moved with compassion. There was another person in the Bible who did the same thing. His name's Jesus. Eight times in the Gospels, we see this term. He was moved with compassion. Moved with compassion. Matthew chapter 14, 14. And when Jesus saw, went out and he saw a great multitude, he was moved with compassion. Question, when was the last time you were moved with compassion? Our head can stop us, but our heart will be moved with compassion. And he healed the sick. When we're in authentic relationship with Jesus... A heart for people becomes, well, it's God's heart he shares with our heart. And we begin to take on God's heart. But he's a Samaritan. So what? But he doesn't, they don't, you got to understand, I'm, I'm a Samaritan. That's a Jew. Should I really stop? How many times people don't look like us? They don't act like us. They're maybe not from the same background. So, so we may give them a curtsy, but we'll just kind of move around. How many times do we not roll up our sleeves and get involved in other people's lives because they're from, well, they're, they're different than us. I don't recommend a lot of movies. I don't recommend a lot of books. I, I don't. And because somebody's going to say something about something. So I just don't. You're lost. But anyway, so I just, I want to recommend a movie to you guys. All right? And I saw it this week. How many of y'all have seen The Jesus Revolution? How many of y'all see it? Isn't that powerful? By the way, by the way, by the way, this is cool. So, so, so this week, my wife and I went. There was only, well, we, we went with a couple from the church. So one, two, three, four. There was three people two rows ahead of us. They were from Church of the King. And there was a couple over there. They were from Church of the King. So it was just, we're basically financing the whole movie theater. I mean, there's no, I, I don't know. <laughs> but it was amazing. So, so for those of you that have seen it, you'll, this point will make sense. For those of you who have not, you need to see it. So, so here's the point. Chuck Smith, who's the pastor, of course, later the founder of Calvary Chapel. He was pastor in this church and... And so the, the actor, of course, Lonnie Frisbee in the movie, the actual guy, Lonnie Frisbee, came in, and he's a hippie. He's, he's a hippie, and, and Chuck Smith, he's, you know, he's the traditional pastor, a little bit older, and, and here comes these guys, and all these hippies are, are coming in, and, and, and they're wanting God. And boy, there was, do you remember that? There was a real, there was a real challenge there. What's he going, what's, what's, they didn't look like them. They didn't sound like them. They're different. The guy goes up, shares his testimony, and his wife leans over. He doesn't have shoes on. <laughs> Chuck was faced with that. <clears throat> Am I going to stop? Am I going to help? I, I wonder, I wonder how many people are, are we missing reaching because they don't sound like us. They don't look like us. I, I, they just, they're just different than us. I tell you, Church of the King, my God, the music's so loud over there. Well, it is loud because y'all can't sing, and so we just make it loud. I'm joking. <clears throat> I'm joking. It's loud for me, too. I'm like, golly. Is it? But the point is this. I wonder, oh, well, let's never come to the point that we're so dignified that we can't reach across the aisle and reach somebody that doesn't look like us. That's a whole message I could preach right now. <clears throat> I, 
I got to go on. Point three. By the way, for all of the administrative personalities, I have a confession. It's not a confession of sin. This is called a mistake. You know, in our culture, they call mistakes sins and sin. No, no. This is not a sin. Remember, a sin is violating God. A mistake is missing a U-turn. Let me talk about a mistake because I know some of you were so troubled this week. I actually missed point three last week in my message. How many of y'all knew that I missed point three last week? Raise your hand. You get extra credit in heaven, ma'am, right there. Everybody. You, you outed the pastor. Okay, I, I actually missed the point. Point three today. We must take risks and pay a price to love others. Luke chapter 10, verse 34, he went to him. Here's the good Samaritan. He goes to the guy and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to the inn and he took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and he gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him. And he said, when I return, when I return, I will reimburse you for all the extra expenses you may have. Let me tell you two things about this Samaritan. Number one, he took a big risk. He, he took a risk. What was the risk? What if he stops and somebody jumps out and robs him? Could you imagine what was going through his head? I wonder if he thought this thought. I'll just everybody, all of our locations lean in. I wonder if he's. I wonder if he was thinking this thought. I'm a Samaritan. And that's a Jew. I wonder if that man would stop for me. I wonder. I don't know. He took a risk. Number two. The second thing is he risked his reputation. What if the other Samaritans see me intermingling with a Jewish man? What are my friends back home going to say? Man, it's... Oh... But his, his heart overrode his head. Man, may our hearts, boy, sometimes they just need to override our heads. Sometimes we just got to, everybody say, go with it. You just got to go with it sometimes. Well, if I help this person, are they being responsible? Am I setting them up for success? Am I giving a fish where should I, I should really teach them how to fish? All of those things. By the way, serving others costs. It costs. It costs us something. Sometimes our time, resources. Now, back to the Lord and we're done. Oh, you're going to see it. You're going to see it. You're going to see it. Look at verse 36. This was the whole point. Two questions. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Who is my neighbor? If he would have just stopped right there and confessed his need, it would have been over. Just confess your need. You can't perfectly live up to it. You need God's help. Jesus then goes through this whole elaborate thing. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Well, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Watch this. This man, oh, please don't miss this. This man thought that Jesus was holding up a picture of what the perfect neighbor looked like. That's what he thought. But that wasn't the point. Can I tell you what the point was? He didn't give him a picture to look at. He actually gave him a mirror to look at. Guess who that guy thought he was? He would have thought, well, I'm the Maybe the priest or the Levi. No, 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 no. You know who that guy was? That guy was actually the one that was robbed, left for dead on the road. That was the guy. In other words, in other words, the guy, the guy that was the lawyer that, that was justifying himself, Jesus was like, you don't get it. You don't get it. You're not, <laughs> you don't understand. Until you see yourself that you've been, you're, you've been robbed by sin. You've been, you've been bruised by Satan. You've been left on the road for dead. Until you see yourself like that, you can't be saved because you don't need a savior unless you realize how lost you are.
He thought he was the priest. Well, I'm at least this good. No, it's not about who. It's you're the one on the road. I'm the one on the road, by the way. And so are you. Everybody. Why? Because you can't get saved until you know your need to be saved. The good news isn't the good news until you know the bad news. The good news is Christ came. Christ died. Christ rose from the dead. Here's the bad news. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we've been ripped by sin and ripped by Satan. And we've been mocked, left for dead. But here's the good news. Guess who the good Samaritan is in the story? Guess who he is? It's actually Jesus. Jesus who, 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 who didn't have to stop. While we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. An enemy of a Jew, a Samaritan, when he didn't have to do it, you know what he did? He stepped into this man's world and he loved him and he cleansed and he poured in the oil and the wine and he picked him up and he washed him and by the way he didn't just wash him then he put him into a safe place and by the way then he paid for it then he gave him a future and a hope how many are grateful that the good Samaritan has saved your life oh and I gotta tell you and I have no shame telling you how messed up I was because I'm not that same person anymore how about you how about you I'll sometimes start talking about my testimony. I'll just start crying. I'm like, not because I'm a preacher. I didn't become a preacher two years after becoming a Christian. <laughs> he thought he was getting a picture. Jesus is so smart. He handed him a mirror. He's handing you a mirror today. Not to shame you, but to save you. Not to condemn you, but to cleanse you. And until you recognize you've been stripped by sin, you've been robbed by Satan, and you've been left for dead. But there's a good Samaritan named Jesus that will wash you and cleanse you and pick you up and make you new. Isn't that powerful? I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads right now. I just sense the Holy Spirit right now. Right now. Wherever you're watching, whether you're in one of our... The jails or prisons, those that are watching online, one of our locations, the Holy Spirit, God loves you. God's not mad at you. He's gone to great lengths to reach out to you. Maybe you're invited to church. Or maybe somebody picked you up and said, please come. This today was for you. It's for you. I promise you I'm not going to embarrass you, but just in just a moment, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. If you say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. I need the blood of Jesus to wash me, to cleanse me. I realize I'm, I'm on that road. And although it looks pretty on the outside, although my job, I know spiritually I have been so bankrupt. Mentally and emotionally, I, I recognize today, Pastor, I need a Savior. I need help. It's hard for people to admit that. It's hard for people to recognize all of sin. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He, it's a gift. You don't earn it, it's a gift. So if you say, Pastor, pray for me, I need Christ. I need the blood of Jesus to wash me, to cleanse me, and to make me new. At the count of three, all of our locations, I'm just going to ask for a show of hands. Say, Pastor, I need Christ. I need the blood of Jesus to wash me and cleanse me. If that's you, one, two, three. Quickly hold your hand up high so I can see it. I'm going to pray. God bless you guys up top. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, my friend. God bless you, buddy. God bless you up top. Yeah. God bless you right there. Yeah. The presence of Jesus is here. God loves you. He loves you. He wants to cleanse you and pick you up. Yeah. Let's pray together. Church family, let's pray with those that are trusting Christ right now. Can, can we do that? Let's all pray together. Say, dear Jesus, I come to you today. A sinner in need of a Savior. Say this. Say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I let go of my past, and I turn to you. I turn to the cross. Say, Jesus, wash me with your blood. Give me a new heart, 
a new life, a new reason to live. I want you to say this. Say, Jesus, I take my life and I put it in your hands. From this day forward, I belong to you. Let me pray, Father, I thank you for the sealing work of the Holy Spirit and the word of the living God taking root deep in the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name. Wow, what an amazing message. If you have anything that really impacted you from today's message, please share that in the chat. One of our hosts would love to talk with you. Or if you're here and you're making the decision to follow Christ for the first time, we wanna join our faith with yours and celebrate with you because that's a huge deal and we're so excited for you. Yes, and if you made that decision, the Bible says that you are made new in Christ. And we are so excited to do this journey alongside of you. Yes, absolutely. If you are here today and you're making that decision, let one of our hosts know. They'd love to just chat with you or you can text DECISION to 822-822 and we'd love to just send you some resources that'll help you walk out this new life with Christ. Yes, and next week will be our final week of this series, Parables, Life Lessons from Jesus. So you're not gonna wanna miss it. See you next week, same time. Same place. Love you guys. Have a great rest of your week.